Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Minwi Maitri. I appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, deliver the Dharma talk tonight. And um, my inspiration comes from some readings I've been doing lately. Lately, I've been studying the teachings of, of Matsu, uh, who, whose Dharma name that he took, Ma was his family name. Uh, so Matsu basically means master, patriarch, Tzu, um, the American translator who translates, uh, who's translated recently a lot of Zen Chan text, um, has translated Zhu to mean sudden, like sudden awakening. So master, master Ma, uh, would be called, uh, sudden horse because ma means horse so anyway he translates his name a lot of different ways but when when ma decided to uh become a monk he took on a new dharma name as many of us do and the dharma name that he took on was dao yi which meant like the entire way and the way it's written in chinese would be way entire so david hinton and the way he translates things uh he always gives the English translation to these Chinese names. So tonight you may hear me talk about Matsu uh, and call him Wei Entire, because that's what David Hinton translates his name to. Um, and it's important to understand why he chose a name like Wei Entire, uh, because a lot of his teachings were very Taoist. Uh, and so the way that Tao Yi, that name that he chose is very Taoist in nature. Uh, so anyway, just keep that in mind. If I call him Wei Entire, that's because David Hinton translates his name that way. But no, I'm talking about Matsu. Um, so about 1,300 years ago, 1,300 years ago, uh, the story goes like this. This was in the middle of the uh, Tang Dynasty in China. There was a monk named Wei Entire, Dao Yi. He wasn't a master yet. Uh, and he sat for long days of meditation at the Dharma Transmission Monastery. And the abbot there, uh, Nan Yue Hui, Hui Rang, uh, which David Hinton translates as South Mountain. So the abbot there, South Mountain, looked over and he saw Matsu, Wei Entire. And he saw that he was what was translated as a true vessel of the Dharma. So the master, South Mountain, walked over to him and said, uh, my good man, meditating all day like this, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to become Buddha, required, replied Matsu. South Mountain picked up a brick and began grinding it out on a stone in front of the shrine. What are you doing? Matsu asked. Polishing this brick into a mirror. But how can you how can grinding a brick make a mirror? How can sitting in meditation make a Buddha? And thus began this young monk's enlightenment series. Challenged in kind of a weird way by a by a Zen master. That began the pattern that Matsu began to use as he became more enlightened and how he would challenge his students. And so it was a very important pattern in Chan development. This was a period in the uh, development of Chan. This was like uh, 40 years or so after the death of the sixth patriarch, uh, Hui Neng. And with the, uh, um, with the story of Hui Nung and the teachings of Hui Nung, Chan really began to develop into the Zen that we know of today. Uh, and these teachings by Matsu and later his grand student, um, Lin Ji, uh, became the basis for this uh, Lin Ji or Rinzai type of uh, of Buddhism that we call 
Linji Zen um, or Rinzai Zen, where meditation is not nearly as important as this sudden awakening that we hope to gain through Konglans. Um, so all this began more or less um, with Matsu. And Matsu fit into this category of teachers that Linji also did, and Huang Bo did, and Bai Jiang did, uh, called a, a category of wild and woolly teachers. They, they, did, they had weird antics and things that they did. They would box people on the ears or smack them in the cheek or whatever as a way of trying to help them wake up. Uh, and they had many students. And Matsu was known to have over 100 students that he passed uh, Dharma transmission to. Of course, you can imagine uh, when Chan was in its infancy and a, and a great master like Matsu had 100 students that he had passed Dharma transmission to, they were able to fan out all, around all of China uh, and have hundreds of students of their own. And so Chan, Chan began to grow uh, exponentially about this time. Again, we're talking 1,300 years ago. Um, so if you've ever been to Maine or you've ever been to Vermont, it was about like that. Um, by that, I mean wide open spaces of hills and rivers and not a lot of people around. Uh, take that for what it is. So anyway, um, to give you an example of some of these teachings of Matsu and how he would train people, here's another one. So, uh, and this is one of my favorites. So Grandmaster Sudden Horse Way and Tire was walking along with his student, Hundred Elder Mountain, which is Bai Zhang. Okay, so Bai Zhang became a, uh, one of the great teachers of Lin Ji. So he was, he was, a, stu he was a student, Bai Zhang was a student of uh, Matsu. And so they were out walking along uh, when they saw wild ducks flying over. And the Grand Master asked, what is that? Wild ducks, replied Hundred Elder Mountain. Where have they gone? They've flown away. Matsu pinched Hundred Mountain, Hundred Elder Mountain's nose and twisted it really hard until Hundred, Hundred Elder Mountain cried out pain. And the master said, when did wild ducks ever fly away? Bai Zhang wasn't quite awakened yet. And you can see in this little story, wild ducks don't have anything to do with the self. And Bai Zhang was saying they flew away. Flew away from what? Flew away from him? The world did not revolve around Bai Zhang. And this was part of the lesson that Matsu was trying to teach the, this later great master, right? Was that stop thinking of the world as centered on you. Start thinking of yourself as no self, as just part of this fabric that weaves the whole universe, the whole cosmos together. So part of this pattern that Matsu would do was teaching his students in a way that he too had to learn. So back in the 1930s, there was a Chinese historian by the name of Hu Shi, um, actually very famous the Chinese historian, a uh, professor at Harvard, uh, studied under some of the greatest historians of the time, but he was native Chinese and he spoke and read Chinese. And so he translated a lot of old documents. Uh, he's famous for, uh, for kind of having uh, written debates with uh, Suzuki, who was most famous for bringing Japanese Zen to America in the 30s and 40s. So he was a contemporary of Suzuki and they, they wrote uh, competing uh, journal articles back and forth. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Hushi was the historian. He wasn't a Zen practitioner. Of course, we all know as, uh, as, as uh, Suzuki was uh, a great Zen practitioner. And so they really often wrote about things from different perspectives. And so it seemed like a debate, but one was talking purely history and the other one was talking purely um, Zen as a teaching. And, and so rarely did the two really have a meeting of the minds. Nevertheless, I think 
uh, Hushi uh, did a great example of describing how a Zen master in these early days of Chan, these early days of Zen, would teach their students to awaken. And so I'm going to read to you a little bit of what Hushi wrote. He said, first, the master must not make things too easy for the novice. He must not preach to him too plain, in too plain of a language or in any language at all. This is important so that one of the great ma this is so important that one of the great masters said, I, I owe everything to my teacher because he never told me anything nor explained anything to me. When the novice comes to the master with some, su with some such abstract question as what is the meaning of Zen or what was the message of Bodhidharma or what's the message of Buddhism, the teacher will say to him, when I was in Nanking last time, I made a coat weighing seven pounds. Or he will say to him, my dear fellow, how fine are the peach blossoms on yonder tree? Or he would shout at him in a deafening shout. You can, might think of uh, Sung Sun. Or, if he was really deserving, he'd get a box on the ear. So that monk then retires to the kitchen, puzzled and probably burning with shame, or with the pain on his cheek. He stays on, and after a while, will be told, you need to leave this monastery. Go try your luck with some other Zen master. So here begins the second phase of this development of the Zen monks back in the day which was technically from one hill to another, presenting his silly questions to various grandmasters presiding over different monastic schools. If he fails to understand, he moves on to the next one. Most of the famous teachers did much traveling during their period of student life. Matsu among them, he traveled for 20 or 30 years on foot, going from monastery to monastery, mountain to mountain. So a monk travels always on foot, Carrying only a stick, a bowl, and a pair of straw sandals, he begs all the way for his food and lodging and often has to seek shelter in decaying temples, caves, and ruined houses by the roadside. He has to suffer the severities of the weather and is subject to all forms of danger and hardship, but all hardships intensify his life. The beauty and grandeur of nature ennobles his mind. Again, I say, think of it kind of as a... Uh, the Green Mountains, or maybe up in Maine, you're traveling around, you feel really feel that beauty of nature. That's what these monks had to uh, experience as part of their development process. He meets kindred souls troubled more or less by similar problems, and he lives with them, befriends them, and they discuss things with him. In this way, his experiences are widened and deepened, and his understanding grows. Then someday he hears a chance remark of a charwoman or a frivolous song of a dancing girl or the chirping of a bird on yonder tree, or he smells the fragrance of a nameless flower and he suddenly understands. All of his previous inquiries and searches and experience become correlated somehow and the problem seems so clear and the solution so evident. The miracle has happened and he attains his sudden enlightenment. Matsu was constantly telling his students, stop looking elsewhere. Stop looking, but keep going. Stop looking, keep going. You'll find the true Buddha Dharma, the true way in ordinary mind. Notice, kind of like Master Unsan's question, about mind at the beginning. Is it your mind or is it just mind? Is it the mind? Matsu just called it ordinary mind. He didn't say it's in your ordinary mind. It's not in my ordinary mind. It's in ordinary mind. What is that ordinary mind? It's the it's mind at that origin tissue at that part of the cosmos where everything is tied together before words are ever put to describe something. It's ordinary life. So these monks had to go through their own sort of suffering. And this is where, interestingly enough, the teachings of the historical Shakyamuni Buddha 
start to really coincide with the teachings of ordinary mind. These monks who, who later became, you know, Zen masters in their own right, who were, who were followers of Matsu, they had to learn things. They had to experience the world. They had to experience the grandeur of the mountains and rivers that were a constant part of, of Zen poetry or Zen uh, artwork at the time. And as they would experience these things, they would suffer the cold, they would suffer hunger, they would suffer sore feet from walking, whatever. The suffering helped them wake up. It was the suffering of Sakyamuni Buddha that helped him wake up. Without it, he would have never awakened. But with it, he did. And the same thing was true in understanding ordinary mind. So finally, the last story I have to give to you goes like this. And it kind of shows the teachings of how Matsu would teach his students. A monk asked Matsu, I'm done with clever ideas like four essential distinctions and hundreds of neg negations. Please, Master, just point directly at that original mind that Bodhidharma brought from the West. I'm exhausted today, replied Matsu. I can't explain it for you. Go ask the Master on the other mountain. The monk journeyed away and asked the next on the next to the next monastery and asked, to which the Master said, why didn't you ask Matsu? He told me to come ask you. I have a terrible headache today. I can't explain it for you. Go ask Bai Zhang. So the monk traveled to the next mountain, went to ask Bai Zhang. Bai Zhang said, I've gotten to the point where I don't understand it at all. Disappointed, the monk left again. Finally, he went back to Master Matsu, and he told him what happened. Matsu said, the first master's head is bright and clear. Baiju's head is dark and mysterious. He didn't give him an answer. Because a Zen master can't give you the answer. And that's what Matsu was trying to teach. The answer has to come from within. You got to figure it out yourself. So go travel. Experience the world. The more you experience, the more you see the ordinary, the more you'll understand ordinary mind. Stop looking, but keep going. You'll find in everything the ordinary.